or so, I was in San Francisco for the launch of a friend of mine's church, Sozo Church. My buddy Jason Laird planted a great church right in the heart of San Francisco. And uh, so we went out to support him and woke up one morning and I did my year in the word quiet time that I try to do just about every morning. And, um, and then I got onto Facebook. That was not part of my quiet time, uh, by the way. It was after the, after the quiet time. And somebody, uh, one of you guys actually posted a, a link to a song and with the comment that went something like this, uh, if you think that all of the Christian lyrics and the Christian music that's be written, being written these days is shallow, which I do not, but he said, if you do, you need to listen to the lyrics of this song. And, and it's a song that we all just sang together, so will I. All of our campuses did it together, and I listened to this song by Hillsong United, and it just wrecked me. I would sitting in the bed in a hotel room. And I woke Lisa up, and I was like, Lisa, you gotta listen to this song and she listened to it and she had the same reaction. It was like, man, the lyrics and the truth and the song just kind of messed, messed with me. And so I immediately texted Brandon and Tara and Nate, some of our worship team and said, hey, have you guys heard this song? And had some ideas, like we need to sing this song. And, and they began to listen to it. And together we, we decided to, to name this series that we're starting today, So Will I. We knew we were gonna do a worship series because how can you do a year in the word? and read all of those beautiful psalms and not do a series where we talk about worship. But we're calling it So Will I because I think at its baseline definition, there's no better description of what worship is, right? Like God spoke galaxies into being and as we sit here right now, they are still expanding and responding to his word. You know, there's a Psalm 104 where it talks about creation literally the animals that God created, and I love it because their response to God, even to this day, is worship. It says, oh Lord, what a variety of things you have made. In wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the ocean, vast and wide, teeming with life of every kind, both large and small. They all depend on you to give them food as they need it. And it says, when you supply it, they gather it. You open your hand to feed them and they are richly satisfied. So even the animals of the earth, when they breathe in the breath that God gave them and they take the food that God gave them, it richly satisfies them because they're doing what they were created to do. And it's an act of worship back to God. There's this moment in Jesus's life towards the end of his earthly life when he's going back into Jerusalem on a donkey. You guys may remember that. It's the triumphal entry. It's the last time he would go back to Jerusalem. And, and it says that there were people that were worshiping and falling down and laying palm fronds you know, in front of him as he was riding this donkey back into Jerusalem. And one of the Pharisees gets mad and says, Jesus, you better stop them from worshiping. And I love what Jesus said to him. Look what he says. He says, this is Jesus. If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. So you wanna quiet the people, that's fine, but if we did, these rocks that are lining these roads, they would burst into cheers because that's what creation was meant to do. And so we're starting a series called So Will I because if, if, if creation is gonna respond in worship, I want our church to be a church that responds in worship, that we do what we were created to do. I'm excited about it. I, I know... Um, and thank you, Jordan, for playing behind me. I wish he'd just stay for the whole time. It's kind of nice and soothing, but you can go. Um, but, but as we jump into this series, um, I couldn't help but wonder if there are many, many people who attend Seacoast either in this building or at one of our campuses or maybe even online, and you love this church and you love our services, but I wonder if there are some who, who just completely miss the point of what the singing part of our services is all about. And that's not said as an insult, but just as a question. Like I wonder if we fully grasp why we do the singing parts of our worship services. And, and here's what I believe. I believe that the songs that we sing will shape the lives that we live. I really do, and for some of you that's bad news. Because going down in a blaze of glory is your jam, and you're like, oh. <laughs> or friends in low places, you're like, why don't I have any good friends? That might be part of the problem. <laughs> 
But I really do, I believe that the songs that we sing will shape the lives that we live. And if you're not really into music and you're kinda like, oh goodness, am I gonna need to take a pass on this series? I just wanna encourage you, we're gonna talk about a whole lot more than the singing part of our services. We're gonna talk about other aspects of worship. But, but if you feel that way about the singing part, then there's a good chance that you sh- you're supposed to be here during this series. This would be a series where God would stretch you because the songs that we sing shape the lives that we live. And there's really probably not a better example of that in scripture than, than Moses. You guys remember Moses? You saw the movie, right? Uh, you know, 10 Commandments. You know, Moses, we know him for kind of this season of his life where he came into Egypt and he rescued God's people out of the, the, the state of slavery that they were in and he helped to, to, you know, God parted the Red Sea through Moses and he brought down the 10 Commandments and all these incredible miracles and moments in the life of Moses. But did you know that all of that stuff that we remember him for was born out of a moment of worship, out of a moment spent in God's presence where God spoke to him and it literally shaped his life. It gave him vision for the rest of his life. And I'm really believing and praying that as we kind of journey together on this series that there may be some of you who are here that God may speak and it may change the whole trajectory of your life. You know, it's happened before. There are businesses that exist in our communities that were born out of a word that God gave somebody in a a worship service. It may be that he speaks hope or or healing in your life, but that God's gonna do some incredible things. And so if worship, if the songs that we sing will shape the lives that we live, what are some things that will shape our worship? I wanna give you three simple words that will shape our worship. The first one is look, look. So, So I told you that that significant portion of Moses' life was born out of a moment that he had in worship. And what I wanna do is I wanna look at that moment together because you may not know this, but Moses, the first 40 years of his life, he was actually in a, grew up as a, as a child of the emperor, of Pharaoh. Uh, so he was, you remember he was born a Hebrew boy and, and at the time there was a kind of a decree that all the Hebrew boys had to be killed and so he was put into this little basket. We call them Moses baskets now. We had them you know, for all of our kids but, but literally he was floated into the Nile River and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and so he becomes adopted and he grows up for the first 40 years of his life in, in royalty as a Hebrew guy adopted into this royal family. And then at 40 years old, he's out and about and he sees a Hebrew person, someone he identifies with his heritage being abused by an Egyptian person and he acts out in rage and he kills, he murders this Egyptian. Well, other people saw it and so the next 40 years of his life is spent on the run. He, he flees, he has to get out of there and for 40 years he's with his father-in-law, Jethro, as a shepherd, basically tending sheep. And this moment of worship that he has that changes the rest of his life happens when he's 80 years old. And I say that because there may be some of you that are here this weekend and you think, well, maybe I'm too old to get a fresh word from God. Maybe, maybe the best in my life is already behind me and I wanna encourage you that that's not the case. Or maybe you're here and you go, well, if you knew what I've done, I've made some mistakes or there's some stuff in my past that God may, may not wanna give me a fresh word for the future. Well, Moses had killed a guy and run. Uh, and so I, I think we're all on level playing field that, that if we're open to it and if we'll look, that God might speak to us and, and all the more reason for us to look. Here, here's what happened, look at the story. Moses, remember he's 80 years old now, he was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, which was known as the mountain of God. And I think that's significant because there was some reason why he knew that there was something sacred about this mountain. God had done something there. And and so when we talk today, we're really gonna talk about what happens in our worship experiences as a church, although worship floods every part of our life. But today I wanna build a foundation about what might happen in the mountain of God or in the house of God in, in, in church as we come. And it says, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. So this is that burning bush moment. But look what he did. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. You may wanna circle that word, he looked. He took time to observe what was going on. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. He stopped and he looked. Now I've got three kids, I've got a 10-year-old and an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, and 
Uh, I don't know if this is true in your home, but in my home, if I come home from like work or I go from one room into another room, my kids are there. If they're distracted with anything, if they're watching TV or playing a video game, I can say just about anything I want to and they will not hear me. Like it's just, uh, judge me if you will, it's just what happens. Sometimes I'll even kind of test it with Miles. He's on the front row. He probably doesn't even know this, but there have been times I've said, Miles, I'll give you 20 bucks if you'll come over here in the next 10 seconds. No clue. Yeah, he's just rocking and rolling on his video game. And, and so what we've learned is that what we have to do is we have to get their attention if we're gonna say something important to them. And so I'll say, hey, Miles or Greta Kate or Ellie, look at me. I want you to look at my eyes. I'm getting ready to say something to you. And so if they'll stop and they'll look at me, then I can say something to them and they will, they will hear what I had to say. Will they obey? It's none of your business. Most of the time they do, probably more than yours do, but not always, but they'll hear me, right? Because they're so distracted that if they don't look, then they'll hear. And I'd love to think that as adults, we outgrow that, right? <laughs> but we don't, do we? I mean, we are so distracted. We've got so much vying for our attention with our smartphones and our connectivity. And, and, and I wonder how often that we miss what God might be doing because we're just distracted with other stuff that's going on. I also wonder what would have happened if Moses would have experienced this burning bush moment today in our culture. Yeah, I wonder if he would have had his iPhone out and he's tending the sheep and he's looking up every now and then, right? Because, you know, you wanna make sure that sheep don't fall off the mountains like you guys do when you're driving. You look up every now and then, but he's, he's what? That's not a good thing, by the way. I wonder if he would have even seen it if he would have even noticed that there was a burning bush in his presence because he would have been so distracted, which is why it's so important for us to look. And I just wanna encourage you during this series to look for what God is doing. You know, I'm afraid that some of us, we come into church and even here on this weekend, we've got all this stuff going on in our minds and in our lives that we're thinking about or maybe that are weighing us down that, that we would even become a people who would just start going through the motions and just start kind of doing church because that's what we do without recognizing that the living God is in the room and wants to connect with us. We just gotta look, gotta draw near. So maybe you wanna even start coming early during this series. To go, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna break the mold a little bit to, to look. Maybe you come into the worship center and just kind of quiet yourself to get you in a place where you're looking. I know one of the things that I'm doing during the series, it's been very hard for the first week because I love sports radio. I don't wanna just know that Clemson won. I wanna know how they won. I wanna hear the analysis of it. But I'm just listening to worship in my car uh, during this series just because I wanna pay attention. I wanna be locked into what God might be saying in my lives. And, and what would it look like for you to look? I love this passage in James 4, 8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a promise. So if we'll look, if we'll draw near, he's gonna draw near to us. First simple word that might shape our worship is let's look. Second one is listen. Listen. Not only do we look, but we have to listen. Let's go back to the story. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him, called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. So I have a question for you. When did God speak to Moses? It was after he saw that Moses was paying attention. You know, that, one of the lyrics that we sang in that song, So Will I, is that there's no breath or, or word that, that's wasted or that's void. And that's not the lyric because it was much better than that. But it, but it spoke to the fact that God doesn't waste his breath. He waited until Moses was looking at him and then he spoke and the words that he would speak to Moses would change his life dramatically, drastically alter the course of his life. And so, so we not only have to stop and look, but we have to be willing to listen as well. And you know, I, I think if you're new to Seacoast or you've been coming for just a little while, you've probably noticed that we do things a little bit differently than maybe the church that you grew up in. And you're like, yeah, there are a lot of things you do differently. But one of them, probably the mo main one, is the worship flow. You know, it's a little different. We do a lot of the worship on the end of our service. And part of the reason that we kind of do that and we started doing it over 10 years ago is because we really sensed that God wanted more for us in worship. And that uh, unfortunately for a lot of us, it takes us about that long to get to a place where we can stop and, and, and listen and, and hear from him. But, but we ask the question, what's God saying to you at the end of every message? And in one sense, God's basically saying the same thing to all of us because you're all hearing the same teaching week after week, but the miracle of the Holy Spirit 
is that in the midst of all of that, he also speaks uniquely to each of us. And there have been some of you that have come out into the foyer and you know, met, met us after a service and said, have you been reading my email? Because God, like, it's like you know what I'm going through. And, and that's not possible. That's just evidence of the Holy Spirit at work in our life and in your life that we're both listening and God's able to speak uniquely to each of us. And that's why we respond the way we do. Listen, because the voice of God, this magnificent creator wants to speak to each of us in his presence. And, and, and it just blows my mind. I mean, think about it. What's the first thing that God ever said? In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And, and as he utters these words, just show you how powerful the words of God are, boom forms the sun that we here on planet Earth are located 93 million miles away from it because if we were any closer, it'd burn us up. Like that was out of the breath of God. That was out of one word from God. And yet that same God with all that power wants to speak life and breath and hope and healing into us, but we have to be willing to listen. What's God saying to you? So three simple words, look, listen. And the third one is lean in. Technically that might be two words, but I put a hyphen in it just to make it one. And so, so, so lean in. <laughs> Lean in. Look what happens in, in the story with, uh, with Moses. Then he said, this is God talking, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So God wants him to know this is special, this is unique. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And what, what I love about that passage is that when Moses realized what was going on, he got uncomfortable. He took his shoes off, he hit his face, he, he, he stretched out of his comfort zone. He knew the magnitude of the moment and so he was willing to lean in and to listen to God. And here, here's, here's my goal for this series. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna do some things differently that we've never done before. You're gonna hear from some different people and, and it's gonna be great. But what I wanna encourage you and ask you to to kind of consider is would you be willing to lean in during the series? Would you be willing to get out of your comfort zone a little bit as it relates to worship? And, and let me say this, there are some of you, you're here today, maybe you were invited by a friend, maybe you're here for the very first time, and you being in church right now feels out of your comfort zone. And I say, great job, you're doing this. You're already stepping in, you're, you're in an environment you're not, you're not used to, and, and you're out of your comfort zone. And it's usually in those moments that God meets us, but there are a lot of us that we become very comfortable with kind of what we do in worship and we just kind of go through some motions and I just wanna invite you to, to get out of your comfort zone and what I mean by that is be willing to express yourself, not just to, to know in your mind that you love God, but to express that in different ways. And, and, and some of you are like, dude, you know, I'm just not a very expressive person, like that's just not how I am. And you know what, I've seen you at football games, and yes, you are. I've seen you go nuts over some people that you don't even know, have any connection to whatsoever, except they wear your team colors. So why wouldn't we be that much more expressive to God and worship, to just express, he died for us. He laid down his life for us. So I'm inviting you to lean in. How many of you are married in the room? Just show hands. I'm not calling out the singles, I'm just, you're married, okay, a lot of you. What if you told your spouse, you know what, I love you, and we got married, but, but I'm not gonna express that anymore, really. I'm not gonna tell you that. I'm not gonna hug you or show you affection in any way. You know, women are leaning into their husband's ears right now going, don't even think about it. Like, because relationships don't work that way. We continue to express how we feel, and, and that's what I wanna invite you to do. And so for the rest of our time together, I wanna talk to you about a few different expressions. And if you come to church and you look around, you've probably seen these things happening. You've seen people expressing themselves to God in some of these ways. And I just wanna look at them one by one. Why do we do some of these things? What, what's going on? And uh, most of them, all of them that I'm gonna talk about today, these aren't things we made up on our own. These are things that are in scripture. These are things that, that the church, the people of God have been doing for, for ages and ages and ages. So how do we express ourselves in worship? A few of them for us. Number one, clapping. Clapping. We express ourselves by clapping. All kinds of scripture about clapping, but in Psalms, verse 47, verse one, it says, clap your hands, 
all peoples, shout to God with loud songs of joy, of joy. And there's a connection there between clapping and joy. A lot of times when you see clapping in the Bible, it's, it's something that they're doing out of joy. And we still do this today in our culture, don't we? I mean, my son plays soccer and we're gonna go watch him play. He scored his first goal two weeks ago of this season. And when he scored that goal, you better believe, we were like, yeah, all right, cheering, clapping, going for it because it was joy and out of our joy, we clapped for God. So, so why do we clap in church? Is it to say, hey, good job, worship team. Y'all are doing a great job. You know, for some of us, that may be what you're thinking when you clap and, and that's, that's fine. They're, I'm sure, grateful for it, but that's not why we clap. In church, we clap because of an attitude of joy, saying, God, I'm so thankful for all that you've done in my life. I, I know I'm not where I need to be, but I remember where I was, and I remember what you've done, and I'm just clapping as an expression of the joy that I feel in your presence. You know, we also clap to, to acknowledge victory to the enemy. I was watching basketball the other day because my Cubs aren't playing baseball anymore. I don't know if y'all noticed that, but this wasn't our year, but wait till next year. Um, I was watching, have y'all seen Lonzo Ball? He's this uh, rookie out of LA. A lot of controversy around him because his dad's kind of got this attitude and cockiness. Well, he was playing in his first NBA game and they were playing against the Houston Rockets and Patrick Beverly is the defender and he's known to be a great defender in the NBA was guarding Lonzo Ball. And within the first couple of minutes of the game, he knocked him to the ground and he basically got up in his face and he clapped in his face to say like, this is not gonna be your day. And I don't encourage you to do that with the people in the row next to you in worship. But I do think there are some times that, man, we clap at the enemy to let him know, hey, you're, you're under my feet. And, and you may have plans and you're gonna attempt to do some things in my life, but I'm just reminding you that I'm in victory, I've already won, and you don't have any place in my life. I'm gonna clap and express victory over the enemy. So we clap sometimes, we do it in worship. Some of you are very comfortable with that, some of you aren't. I encourage you, maybe that would be an area God would say, why don't you lean in? You know, express yourself in that way. Another one is shouting, shouting. Ah, we got some shouters in the house. <laughs> some of y'all sat next to a shouter. You're like, man, my ears are hurting, you know. But why do we shout? Why is shouting such a big deal? Shouting, again, is all throughout scripture, but probably the most famous place that at least I remember it from is, is in the Battle of Jericho. Do you guys remember that? Uh, after Moses had led them to the promised land, Joshua led them into the promised land, and then they had all these battles that they had to fight, and one of them was the battle of Jericho. And so God said, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna go to Jericho. You're gonna, for six days in a row, you're just gonna march around the city walls. And on the seventh day, you're gonna march around the city walls seven times, and, and you're gonna shout, and you're gonna celebrate, and you're gonna declare the victory. And then, after you shout, the walls are gonna fall down. Now, I like to put myself in these stories. Like, what would I be feeling and thinking? We already know how that story ended now, so we know that the walls came down. But if I'm in this story and the walls haven't come down yet, I might make a suggestion to God. Like, why don't we shout after the walls go down? You know, like, it might be good to, I mean, just what, what if they don't go down? Then we've looked a little foolish shouting prior to, but, but the reality is that shouting in Scripture oftentimes is something that happens before the promise is fulfilled before the victory is won. It's, it's something we do in faith to kind of remind ourselves of things that we know are going to happen but haven't happened yet in our lives. And I wonder if there's anybody who might be here this weekend and there's a promise over your life that hasn't been fulfilled yet. That would be the time to shout. I wonder if there are some who maybe are single but you know that God hasn't called you to be single for all of your life. You have a, your heart's desires to get married. Maybe you're in that season where all your friends are starting to get married and you're wondering, God, are you gonna come through on this promise? Now is the time. That would be a good time to shout. There may be some of you that sit, come on. She's right back there, I'm just saying. Some of you, you, you may have a health issue that you're struggling with where, where you, you've got a diagnosis and and, and, and you, you are believing and hoping and, and, and trusting that God's gonna heal you from this, but the healing hasn't happened yet. That would be a good time to shout. The promise hadn't been fulfilled. What promise are you still waiting on? What, what, what hope are you still holding out for? That would be a good time to sing and to shout in faith because what it does is it builds our faith and builds our confidence and we begin to live and act as if the promise has already come true and then we find ourselves seeing the promise come true. So we shout, it's an expression of 
our worship. Another one is singing, singing. Tons of scripture on singing. Yeah, I listed some on your outline sheet. One of them here, Colossians 3.16. This is New Testament. Let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. It was when they gathered together, he was saying, when you do it, you better sing songs and psalms with thankful hearts. And singing has been part of our church tradition for thousands and thousands of years. The church has gathered together and they've sung together. Why do we sing together? You know, I, I'm not particularly very good at singing, if I'm just being honest. Some of you have heard that. You may get a chance to hear it in just a few minutes, but I'm just not. That's not a gift of mine. But man, singing, I love to do it. And part of the reason why we have the volume up here, thank you for the comment cards, by the way, but part of the reason that we do that <laughs> is because I don't wanna hear myself sing, okay? My voice is not that great. We, want, we don't want there to be any barrier uh, to, to you really going after God and expressing yourself. And so we do have the volume up a little bit because we wanna be able to sing with abandonment, not worried about what I sound like or what other people might think about it. But why do we do that? Why do we sing? A couple of thoughts about singing. One, it helps us to remember the truth. You know, think about that. How many of you know the English alphabet? You got that down, Pat, most of you? How did you learn that? You learn to sing your ABCs, right? A, B, C, D, and, and we know that as kids, we're raising up, you put a song to something and they'll remember it a little bit easier. And so when we sing the truth about God's word, it helps us to remember and to internalize and memorize truth. On Thursday morning, I was getting ready for work and my daughter, four-year-old Ellie, was downstairs and I heard her singing a song that honestly, I don't think I have heard in over 20 years, like an old school worship song. And I'm like, what is going on there? So I started listening and sure enough, she's singing and she's singing, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship. I don't know where she learned it. I think probably preschool or something, but I was like, man, I love that because she is singing songs out of memory and, and saying truth over her life that she doesn't even fully understand yet. But there may come a day in the future where she's gonna draw back on that memorized song to remind her about truth in her life. And, and, and you may not be good at memorizing scripture, but you may be surprised that you know more than you think because every song that we sing on the weekends is rooted in scripture. So we sing, it helps us remember and memorize truth. Another thing that it does is it, it, it evokes our emotions. You know, music has a way of evoking emotions, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, I still, I told you earlier, but when I first heard that song that we sang together, it just wrecked me. And when Tara sang it here at this campus about 20 minutes ago, it wrecked me again. Like my emotions were engaged in worship and music has always done that. And there are some that may manipulate that for, for poor reasons, but, but I would just encourage you as we sing together, maybe um, it's difficult for you to express emotion. You know, maybe you grew up in an environment where you didn't do that very much or you're held back. I know I've got a counselor in my life named Chip Judd that tells me I need to get better at, at expressing emotions in my life and music helps me do that. Music will get me to a place emotionally that I can't get to without or that's not naturally for me, natural for me to get to without and so singing will help us in that, that sense. It also, you know what singing does is it unifies us, doesn't it? Music can unify people. You know, I love about our church is that we are so different. You know, we are not going for uniformity at Seacoast. We, we come from all different backgrounds. In fact, there are even some Gamecock fans that worship with us at this church. And <coughs> I've still been having to repent for our church over what Josh Walter said last week about Clemson. It was just it's awful, you know, but, but, but yeah, we, we, and my dad, you know, different and who we pull for, who our allegiances are in sports and yet we come together and we're one. Uh, we have a lot of people in this church who are Democrats politically. We have a lot of people in this church who are Republicans politically and we have people on our staff that are on either side of that and people that have very strong opinions about these issues in our lives yet we walk into church and we're unified and we sing songs that unite us around what we have in common, which is our love and affection for Jesus. Music unifies us. I experienced that this week in Nashville. Actually, it was a couple weeks ago. Dave Ramsey invited Lisa and I to come up to Nashville to spend some time with a few other pastors 
uh, up there. And one of the things that he did is he, he had this night where we went and ate dinner and then he brought, invited a couple of his friends in who are singer songwriters to sing some songs with us uh, as a group of pastors. And he thought, I know these are all pastors and they grew up in the church, so I'm gonna bring some of my friends that they may recognize. And so he brought Stephen Curtis Chapman, Amy Grant, and Michael W. Smith, the three of them, each of them with guitars, and they just kind of told a story about how they wrote a song and then they would sing a song. It's like, ah, oh, that's like the Mount Rushmore of my childhood Christian music, you know? It's amazing. Some of you are like, who are those people? Just bear with me for a minute, you know, it's okay. But Michael W. Smith, and again, we got pastors that are from all different backgrounds, Baptists and charismatic. None of us really knew each other very well at all. But we, we come up to this, this kind of singer-songwriter workshop and, and Michael W. Smith, about two or three songs into it, he's on the piano and he says, you know, I wrote this song about 35 years ago. And he said, if I'd have known that I'd have to sing this song every day of my life for the next 35 years, I might not have written it. But, I, but, <laughs> but he told us a little bit of background story and then he begins to, to play this song. Some of y'all know this song. All those of you are like, what are you talking about? It's called Friends Are Friends Forever. As soon as it happened, he starts singing it. It was like we all look at each other. No! Yes, we're unified. And then he gets into the chorus. And friends are friends forever. If the oh man, I, we are all thinking about every kid who has moved away from youth group, but we sang this song and sent them off every graduation. Like, it's like unifying. We're holding hands, singing. We don't know each other, but we are one around friends are friends forever. You know, and, and, and music just has a way to do that. It, it unifies us, and when we worship, we're not only unified with other believers all around the world, but generations of believers, we sing these songs and it unifies us as a church. You know, uh, I had a high school reunion a couple uh, months ago and we weren't unified around the songs we sing in this church, but man, when Nirvana or Pearl Jam starts playing, you talk about 90s Seattle grunge, man, we talk about unity. Like we are different in a lot of ways. A lot of them were shocked at what I'm doing for a living these days, but man, we could find unity around some grunge music, right? Because that was my, my generation's deal, and your generation has one too, the songs that unify. Even hip hop, I love it, because when I was growing up, hip hop used to be the music that my black friends would listen to, and, and us white people listen to stuff like that. That's why y'all gotta have some grace for us. <laughs> but these days, hip hop has even united races. You know, my son is 10 years old, and he's as white as white can be, but man, he loves hip hop and we listen to it in our house all the time and hip hop is even uniting kind of races and it's so cool to see how the power that music has to unify us and so when we sing, we're, we're remembering spiritual truths and we're you know, invoking some emotion and we're, we're unifying with the body of Christ. It's an expression of worship and many of you come to Seacoast every weekend and I watch you some and, and you don't sing, you just listen and you read the lyrics, maybe that would be a stretch for you. So, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing. I'm gonna say these lyrics over my life. It's an expression that'll help us. Another one is raising hands, raising hands. Why do we raise hands in church? And the Baptists all just got very nervous. <laughs> what are you getting ready to say, dude? You know, because you may have noticed, but you come in here and, and, and there are some people who feel moved to raise their hands. People do it in all kinds of different ways. You know, you've got the carrying the TV hand raise. It's like right down here. <laughs> And then when their emotion gets involved, it's a widescreen, you kinda get out like this. Some of us are a little more reserved and we're kinda right in here, you know, we're kinda, this is how big the fish was, raising hands, it's like, just keep it right here. You got the single woman raising your hands, you know what I'm talking about? It's left hand, it's up, there's no ring on it. I love Jesus and there's no ring on it, I just want you to know. You got the real emotional, you know, you, you got kind of the, the beauty pageant, you know, wave, you know, they're kind of all over the place, they're waving to everybody, we're raising our hands. But why, why do we do that? You know, why do some people raise their hands in worship? It happens all throughout scripture as well. A couple of thoughts around that. Number one, it's, it's expressing a desire to be closer to God. Yeah, I mentioned my four-year-old daughter. My, my older ones don't ask me to hold them very often anymore. And I'm glad because my back can't handle that, but my... No, not right now, Miles. <laughs> he, just, he just looked up at me like, but, but Ellie, man, my four-year-old, she'll re reach her hands up, and man, I am a flawed dad, and I make a lot of mistakes, but when, when she expresses a desire to be close to me, you better believe I'm gonna lean down, I'm gonna grab her, 
and I'm gonna hold her close because I know these days go away before too long. But how much more does our heavenly Father, when we reach up our hands, just say, God, I wanna be, I wanna be closer. Maybe I don't feel closer right now, but I wanna be closer. He leans down and he, he draws near as we draw near to him. It's also an act of surrender. And you raise your hands as an act of, of surrender in various situations in our culture. But in worship, I know for me, I, I love God, but sometimes he asks me to do things that are hard yeses, that, that, that don't come naturally for me. And there are these moments that I'll have in worship where I'll just raise my hands. And for me, it's a way to say, God, I surrender to you. Not my will, but yours. I'm, I'm gonna stop fighting. I'm gonna stop trying to do it my own way. And I just... I, I surrender and something powerful happens in those moments. It can be victory. You know, we, we aren't afraid to raise our hands when our team scores a touchdown, right? And so there are times that we're worshiping, we raise our hands just as a way to say, yes, God, I claim the victory. I celebrate the victory. But raising our hands, expression of worship. One more for you as we close. Bowing and kneeling. Every so often, you may be in a worship environment and you may just sense the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, I want you to get down on your knees. I want you to bow. And it's not as culturally um, normal for us these days, but when the Bible was written, there were kings and queens and emperors, and it was very normal that if you came into the presence of a king, you bowed down. It was a sign of reverence. It was a sign of honor. It was a sign of humility. You were kind of laying yourself low before the Lord, and, and, and I wonder if it wouldn't help us every now and then. And in our culture today, where there's so much kind of pushing us towards, you know, whatever, self-gratification, say, you know what, God, I, I just humble myself and acknowledge that your ways are higher than my ways, and I wanna honor you, and I wanna revere you in your presence. So different expressions of worship. Here's what I wanna ask you to do. We're gonna be in this series for about four or five weeks. Where are you comfortable and are you willing to stretch a little bit? Are you willing to stretch? Why would, why would God want us to do that? You know, one thought, Tara sent me the other day, she's like, you know what? Uh, when we move our hands and we express ourselves, literally the, the molecules in the air are shifted physically and naturally. There's science that will show you that. that and so how much more so spiritually are we kind of setting the, the temperature of a room when we walk into it and we worship and we express ourselves to God? You may occasionally notice somebody sitting around you that really expresses themselves in like some wild ways to God. And here's what I can tell you about those people. God's probably done some really cool things in their life. God's probably healed them of some pretty amazing things. And if they wanna express themselves more power to them. You know what, God's done some really cool things in my life. The lyric, I think, of that song that messes with me the most is at the end of the song, it's talking about God of salvation and talking about Calvary. And when he said, it is finished on the cross. And the lyric says, as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. That's my story. Man, if it were up to my merits and what I've done, I've got no business standing on this platform talking to you about God, but because he spoke forgiveness over my life and grace over my life, 100 billion failures disappeared. And I don't have to live under my failure, I can live above that because God sees me for that. And maybe you've never experienced that yourself and I would encourage you, you can do that this weekend. That's the simplicity of the gospel, is that Jesus did it. He came, he took our sin, our shame, our failure on the cross and he overcame death so that our failures could disappear too. That's the gospel. You just have to say yes to him. But you know what, a lot of you are here this weekend and you've experienced that. You've experienced God's grace and God's forgiveness. And so I invite you to stretch, to reach out of your comfort zone a little bit, to lean in See if God doesn't wanna meet you here. I believe the songs that we sing and the way that we worship will shape our lives. Let's worship over the next few weeks as if our future depended on it. There's a burning bush in the room right now. Do you see him? Do you recognize that God's presence is here among us? 
Are you willing to listen? God, what are you saying to me? And are you willing to lean in and worship? We're gonna respond in all of our campuses in just a couple of minutes. And we're gonna do all the things we normally do here at Seacoast. If you're new, we have a cross and maybe that's your way of shouting. Just kind of, there's something, there's a place of faith that your faith's being stretched and you're waiting on a, a promise to be fulfilled and maybe you wanna go to the cross and write something out there to say, God, I need you. Or maybe you wanna shout as we worship together. We're gonna take communion together. We'll get prayer teams that'll pray for us and light candles. And, but then we're gonna sing and we're gonna celebrate and we're gonna worship. And I invite you to lean in. Would you pray with me as we close? God, I'm so thankful for what you've done in my own life. That 100 billion failures that you can't see because all you can see is the grace and the love that you've offered through your son, Jesus. What a humbling thought. God, I thank you that that is your heart for each and every one of us. And so as your church right now, God, we are choosing in this moment to look Lord, we recognize that your presence is in this space. Don't let us walk right past it. Lord, we don't wanna be just so distracted that we can't see. So would you kind of center our hearts and our minds on you? God, we wanna listen. We recognize the power of your voice. And we just pray, Lord, that you would speak. And that as you speak, we would respond and worship. God, we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen.